Good evening. We'll give people a chance to settle in a little bit. It's good to uh, be back again here on a Wednesday evening for some time of, of uh, prayer, Bible study, a little music here at the Mayberry House. Well, good evening. How are you doing this week? No question that we're in new territory when it comes to world events. I was just looking over the list of governors and uh, looking to see what each governor is planning on. And uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Elizabeth. But I was just looking at those governor's lists to see all on all 50 states what the plan is. And, and of course, April 30 is the big date. Uh, it seems like uh, the plan is up until April 30. A little, few of them have a little bit into May, but most of them are, are uh, lasting until April 30. And, and then we'll see what happens. So a lot, of, a lot depends on what happens in the next two weeks as to what's what the future holds for us. Uh, but there's a lot of unknowns and uh, it's all new territory. Um, the, uh, in the, here in the Minnesota Conference, the churches are going forward online. Um, seems like uh, just about every church Every district, every pastor is doing something online for their churches. So this has really uh, pushed us to do some things that we uh, had thought about doing but hadn't completely implemented. But now we have some more tools that we can use going into the future um, as far as online ministry goes. So... Uh, Last uh, Monday morning, we met with uh, Justin Lyons, met with, uh, he's our president, president of the Minnesota Conference, and we had a, a meeting, an online meeting, with the South Pastors here in the southern part of Minnesota. And uh, he was uh, encouraging us. We were encouraged, encouraged to hear that the Minnesota Conference is uh, in a, in a good financial position, uh, providing the tithes and the offerings continue to come in, in spite of this crisis. Um, we have the March uh, report in today from the conference office, and uh, won't until be until we really see what comes in with the April report and the May report to see how we're doing here, but. Uh, It, it's something just one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time, we'll see how things work out for, for us. But uh, we're starting out in a good place. Uh, not everyone is in, in a, a, a secure place, but uh, none of us, none of us can really say that we're, you know, like, like the Bible says, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we're just totally depending on, on God one day at a time. And, and we know that uh, the Lord will provide for us as we come along. Uh, Sunday night, there was a symposium. I don't know if any of you were able to tune in to that. Uh, it was uh, AWR 360 Health. Uh, if you go to their AWR Adventist World Radio site, um, uh, 360 and go to their health uh, page there uh, you can see this uh, all the the uh, doctors that were lined up to speak for the symposium Sunday night uh, so Karen and I listened to it um, 
it started out with a lot of technical information and it was a lot a very a lot of it was very technical information because it was designed for doctors a lot of scientific background and uh and statistics and everything that went into it um, doctors could get two continuing education credits just for listening to the two-hour presentation um, the but the panel of doctors were discussing the use of hydrotherapy in treating COVID-19 patients and uh, we had wondered about, you know, Karen and I did, took the training out at Andrews University for uh, some of these uh, uh, practices. And, and, and of course, uh, hydrotherapy is just one of, of many uh, health uh, practices that we learned. And uh, we've been wondering how that could fit into this treatment of, of the COVID-19. Well, the bottom line in, uh, after the two-hour presentation is this. Uh, there are basically three stages to COVID-19. First stage is the infection stage when most people don't show any symptoms. The second stage is the symptom stage where you have the fever, the dry cough, the mu muscle aches, and so forth. And then the third stage which a lot of times goes like going over the waterfall. Uh, hospitalization is the hospitalization phase and uh, things can happen very quickly going downhill with the ICU and the ventilator. And the, the bottom line is that it's during that second stage before it gets critical, that second stage where the fever, dry cough and the, and the muscle aches are going on is where hydrotherapy can really make a difference. And so if you'd like to look into that more, that, that was very interesting. You know, it was in 1918 when they had the Spanish uh, flu epidemic. Uh, right here in Minnesota, uh, we had our Swedish seminary just up the road here. We, we just, Karen and I live right on off of, we, we live right on Highway 15, it's right off. I can practically see it from the window here. And Highway 15, you follow that right up through New Ulm and you come to Maplewood Academy. And that's where our Swedish seminary was. And uh, many students became ill during the Spanish flu epidemic where, where uh, thousands and thousands of people lost their lives. And, and many of the students at that Swedish seminary came down with the Spanish flu but not, there were no fatalities because they practiced that, uh, the, the uh, health uh, practices of, of um, with using hydrotherapy and with the fomentations and uh, hot and cold treatments, none of the students that came down with the flu died at the Swedish seminary. And uh, so the doctors are looking at saying, Here's an opportunity for us to really put this tool in, into, into work and save some lives and really do some tests, some clinical tests and, and uh, find out just how much we can uh, accomplish with using these uh, home remedies. So that was interesting. We enjoyed looking at that. Well, last week in our Bible study, we looked at where our focus needs to be, not on conspiracy theories, uh, focusing on things that we cannot know for sure, secret things that may be happening behind the scenes. It's, uh, it can be a waste of time and energy. What our focus really needs to be is on the star of the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, standing as if he had been slain there in, in Revelation chapter 5. And we saw there in chapter uh, 4 and 5 of Revelation how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are willing and eager to help us. 
and are working in tandem together for our eternal salvation. And so in a time of crisis, especially, that's where our focus needs to be, in that heavenly Mount Zion where Jesus stands as mediator for us, as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And uh, the new covenant had, uh, I, I misquoted um, last time the, the, the reference, it's uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, uh, instead of Jeremiah 33. But Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8 and 10, we find the four promises of the new covenant that God says, I'll be their God and they will be my people. Second, everyone is going to know God one day. And the third promise, I will forgive their sins and remember them no more. And the fourth promise, I will write the, my law of love in their hearts. All God's promises of what he's going to do for us in, in this new covenant. This week, I want to to focus on the call in the book of Revelation, the call to come. Because though God is eager to fulfill his promises to us, if we don't come, we don't gain any benefit. Full salvation, salvation full and free, has been accomplished for us by Jesus by his death, burial, and resurrection. But we need to come to receive the benefits of his atonement. We can't do it on our own. Uh, Christianity is not a do-it-yourself religion. Christianity is a supernatural religion that depends totally on a power outside of ourselves to be able to, to do anything good or right and on a salvation that's been accomplished for us outside of ourselves to put our faith in and trust in. And so, so there's an invitation in the book of Revelation, and it's just a one-word invitation. Come! In fact, it says it's with a voice of thunder. Come! And we want to take a look at that this morning. Uh, the background for that gospel invitation of come and we're looking at, at a specific word. There are, are different words for come in the Bible, but this is the imperative. You come. And uh, the, the word in, in the imperative is found seven times in the book of Revelation. And the background for that command to come is found in with the same word in the imperative in the Gospels. The first time we find it is in John, and John, after all, is the, the author of the book of Revelation, and in his Gospel, in John 1, beginning with verse 35, we're going to look at John 1, verse 35 to 39, it says, again, the next day, John was st standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. See, there's the same subject matter as we're looking at in Revelation with the Lamb standing as though he had been slain. John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw him following and said to him, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. It's the same form of the word that we find in Revelation, that invitation. Come, come and you will see. In fact, some of the translations of the, of the book of Revelation add the words, Come and see. Uh, in the original, it's just come. But they see a connection here to, to John's gospel. Come and you'll see. And so 
they came and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And so uh, that's the first time we see that word in John's gospel is that invitation to come, come and see, come and you'll see. John 1, 43 to 46 is, in the, is the next one. Going down to verse 43, it says, The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and Nathanael said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And you remember what Philip said to him? Come and see. The invitation, come and see. Another place is found in Luke, Luke 7, verses 6 to 10. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. So the centurion had, had sent some people to, to invite Jesus to come and heal his servant. And so it says that when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come. There is the same word, same form of the word, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. The next place we find this imperative, come in the imperative, erhu, there's Luke 14, verse 16 to 24. A parable that Jesus told about a great supper. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. So now the invitation goes out. They've already been invited, they've already accepted the invitation, and uh, they've been planning on this for quite some time, and now he sends out the message, come, everything is now ready, just come, we're ready to start. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the, and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. And then the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. So you see a pattern here. You see a pattern here where the invitation is given, the gracious invitation to come to this feast, this free, wonderful feast that, that they can do. All they have to do is come. And yet, when they don't even care enough 
to come because these trivial things are coming in the way. They, there's judgment that comes. They don't get, they will never taste of that supper. Well, that's the same invitation that's given in the book of Revelation. Seven times that same word is found in the book of Revelation, come. The, the last three times is found at the very end in Revelation 22, verse 17 to 21, where it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come! And let him who hears say, Come! And let him who thirsts come! Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that will be written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And then he concludes in verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And John concludes, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's the only time of these seven where the word come is directed toward Jesus. All the others are directed toward people as a gospel invitation to come and accept the free gift of salvation. There are four more times in the book of Revelation, and that's right in what we've been looking at. We've looked at Revelation 4 and 5, and then what follows is the seven seals in Revelation 6, and that's where we find the next four times that this word come is found in the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6. Now, and uh, it's the same gospel invitation. Take a look with me and see if you can, uh, if you can, can see that that's the case. Revelation 6, verses 1 to 8. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. See, now that Jesus is the, the, our high priest, he's acting as our high priest in mediating the new covenant, and he's breaking the seals, getting ready to carry out the provisions that are inside the scroll. When all the seals are broken, then he'll be able to carry out the provisions of this, of this covenant. And uh, that will be a new heaven and a new earth, ultimately. But uh, it says there that I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, turns out this was the lion, the one with the face of the lion. There was the four cherubim around God's throne, you remember and this is the one with the face of a lion saying with a voice of thunder. You've heard a lion roar? Sounds like thunder rolling. The lion says with a voice of thunder, Come! And I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. And if you study that word conquer in the book of Revelation, you find out that all through the message to the seven churches, there's the he who conquers, he who conquers, and a promise is given to he who conquers. And then you remember in Revelation 5, when the lamb, no one is found that can open the scroll, scroll except the lamb, the elder says to John, be of good cheer, because the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And that's why he can open the scroll. And the, the promise to the Laodicean church is, He who conquers, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And now the one who has conquered, Jesus who conquered, on the cross of Calvary is the only one that can open this scroll. And because of his sacrifice, he opens the first seal and the first gospel invitation goes out to come. 
Come to the throne of grace. Come, receive all the gifts that God has to give you there. And if you do, you're going to go forth with that white horse, conquering and to conquer through the power of his Holy Spirit. So that's the first horse. The second, third, and fourth horses are picturing what happens if we don't come. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come! And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So the first, first invitation of the, of the last four, three there is to, is, is to come, and, and there's a, a red horse with the sword. It's connected with sword. And then when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And so I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Why, what's the, what are the scales for? The scales are for weighing out bread in the time of famine. Find, if you re, go to Leviticus 26, you find all of these elements of sword and famine and pestilence, wild beasts. All of these are found there. And so the scales are famine scales. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Because it's, it's famine time. It's uh, exorbitant prices. And do not harm the oil and the wine. So for, first comes the sword and then comes famine. And then when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come! And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Now, actually, pale is the best we can come up in English. But the, literally, what, what, it, what John said was the green horse. Well, you know, when somebody is really, really sick, you say, oh, you're looking a little green around the, the gills there. The green horse, the pale horse. Chloros, this is the same word we get from chlorine and chlorophyll that makes things green. Uh, the green horse, the sickly, sickly green, pale green horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Thanatos, death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill. And then it has all of... All, it reviews the, the three and adds one more. Kill with sword and with hunger, which is famine, and with death. That's, death is also tra uh, translated pestilence sometimes. Sword and famine and pestilence. You've heard that a lot in the Old Testament. And, uh, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Those are all found in Leviticus 26 as the curses of the covenant. God wanted to, to take Israel and to bless them. And as, as long as they followed him and, and, he, and obeyed him, they would have his blessing. They would go forth conquering and to conquer. But he told them ahead of time that if they weren't faithful to the covenant, then he his hand would be his protecting hand would be removed and there would be sword. And, and then if they still were unfaithful, there would be famine. And if they were still unfaithful, there would, be, there would be pestilence, death. And then if they would also be beasts, the uh, wild beasts of the earth. And uh, all of that was fulfilled for Israel when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple and took so many captive, including Daniel and his friends, to Babylon. Sword and famine and pestilence came as a result of unfaithfulness to the covenant. But now this is the new covenant. This is the everlasting covenant. This is the invitation now is given to the whole world. Come. 
The banquet is ready. Come. Salvation full and free is provided at the throne of at the throne of God. Come where the lamb stands as if he had been slain. Where the the sevenfold spirit of God is ready to give you power and 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 to enable you to do what you couldn't do otherwise. Salvation, he has died, he has conquered, he's already won the victory. Just come and receive all the fulfillment of those promises of the new covenant. But for the whole world, just like Jerusalem of old, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, it was a little model and miniature for the whole world, what is coming upon the whole world just before Jesus comes. Sword and famine and pestilence and wild beasts of the earth, it's just like those are code words for the final time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation until that time, Jesus said. But no one needs to fear that time of trouble if they will just come. Come to the throne of grace. You will go forth with a white horse conquering and to conquer. And you'll have a place in God's kingdom. That's the invitation that is given in the book of Revelation to all of us today. And in this time of crisis, more than any other time, it's time for us to respond to that gospel invitation, to come to the throne of grace, to come to receive all that he wants to give us. Come, why suffer sword and famine? Come, why die the second death? Come, Jesus says, ride forth with me to conquer, because my blood has freed you from your sins. And I've, re- I've written a little song that, that really encapsulates this invitation to come, which is uh, embedded there in Revelation 4 and 5 and 6 in the, the seals. There's so much more to the seven seals But that's the heart of the meaning, is the gospel invitation to come to the whole, given to the whole world. I'd just like to sing that for you now. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, take the water of life that's free. Come, why suffer sword and famine? Come, why die the second death? Come, ride forth with me to conquer, my blood has Father sits enthroned above, a scroll he holds in his right hand, complete salvation, full and free, within its seals reserved for me. But who will open this sealed scroll? Who will release the gift of love? Who secures my inheritance? Only the Lamb stands as slain. Come, why suffer sword and famine? Come, why die the second death? Come, ride forth with me to conquer. My blood has freed you from your sins. You are worthy to take the scroll. You overcame to break its seals. You were slain and purchased for God, people from every tribe and tongue. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, power and riches to receive, blessing, honor, and dominion, all creation sings your praise. 
Come, why suffer sword and famine? Come, why die the second death? Come, ride forth with me to conquer. My blood has freed you from your sins. Come, why suffer sword and famine? Come, why die the second death? Come, ride forth with me to conquer. My blood has freed you from your sins. My blood has freed you from your sins. So we have an opportunity once again to to accept anew that gospel invitation to come. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the lamb standing as though he had been slain. The full provision for our eternal salvation is there at the throne of God. A complete atonement made for us. And the invitation is given to come. Lord, Please forgive us where we have neglected to come. And we want to come now. Come to your throne of grace so that you can fulfill your covenant promises to us to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. To write your law of love in our hearts as you forgive us our sins and remember them no more. And we look forward to the time when everyone in heaven and earth will know God and sing your praises. That you will be our God and we will be your people throughout the endless ages of eternity. All because of the Lamb who has conquered so that we can go forth with him, with that white horse, conquering and to conquer. We can't do it on our own. Only through your Holy Spirit's power can that be done and only as a result of coming to you just as we are and so we come and we thank you we thank you for fulfilling your promises to us every day as we continue to come and we just uh, pray that we'll be able to lead others to the throne of grace before it is ever too late that they may receive the gifts that you want to give them at this time. Well, mercy pleads, and we thank you for that mercy and that grace. We put ourselves in your care and keeping, and we thank you for all that you will do as we put our faith and trust in you just one day at a time. We thank you for all of, the, all of your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to have you with us again, and uh, good to, to see our friends, uh, Marty, Marty Jackson. And I was uh, his best man at his wedding, I remember that. Nancy Worley, it's good to have you with us. Uh, Janet Erickson, good to see you. Sarah, Sarah. Brown, uh, Andrew. There's a number of those that I that I've seen, and I they've, their names have gone by. But um, it's good to good to have you with us. And uh, Adeline Flasky, it's good to have you with us too. And and uh, Dan, good to good to have you with us. Now, we're looking forward to uh, next Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And we're going to look at that uh, parable that Jesus told about the sheep and the goats. And the question, when did we? When did we? And uh, so we'll have some, some songs for the kids 
and uh, some other music and uh, we'll have that a message for you and Karen will be with us again and we'll we'll have some a good time together uh, good to see you Kevin thanks so much for tuning in and uh, God bless everyone through the rest of this week one day at a time God will provide what we need and uh, so we put our faith and trust in him God bless you.